Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for tuning in. My name is Ashley Clark. I'm the Director of Film Programming uh, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, or BAM. Um, BAM, like all arts venues, uh, is currently closed due to the ongoing pandemic, um, but we're working to keep bringing our audiences uh, screenings and events in the virtual online space. We're working uh, currently with a number of uh, innovative and very thoughtful distributors, including Zeitgeist Films, Kino Lorber, uh, Grasshopper Films, Magnolia Pictures, Film Movement, uh, and others uh, to provide virtual theatrical engagements of great films, um, some of the proceeds of which uh, go towards BAM uh, if you rent or stream them, um, as we work towards eventually reopening. Uh, if you're not based in Brooklyn, uh, please look into the situation around virtual theatrical engagements uh, nationwide and please consider supporting your local art house theatre. Um, we're going to start the conversation with Matt Wolf, uh, the director of uh, Recorder, the Marion Stokes project, uh, really soon. Uh, but I first wanted to mention that we would love for you to contribute your own questions for Matt uh, in the YouTube chat bar um, to the right of your screen. Uh, and we'll come to those shortly in around 15 or 20 minutes or so. Uh, please do take a minute to read the community guidelines. Um, we reserve the right to delete any comment or remove any user uh, who does not uh, abide by those guidelines. Um, but at this time, I would love to say a, a big thank you uh, to Matt for joining us tonight and, and a hello and welcome. Hi, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, the, the first question, I guess it's appropriate to ask at this time, how are you? Uh, how, how are you doing? Are you, are you managing to uh, keep, keep creative or stay creative? And just wondering what, you, what your kind of general self-care routines are at the moment. I'm pretty good. I have a new film that's coming out soon, so I'm really focused on that, but also um, doing the research and the work that I normally do and trying to keep a good schedule. I'm actually watching long form documentaries with a group of people. We did Shoa, we're doing Eyes on the Prize now. So taking the opportunity to watch long stuff that I normally wouldn't make time for and talking about it with other filmmakers and friends. So it's great. I mean, Thank not you. great, but it's going pretty well. <laughs> yeah, and Eyes on the Prize is just such a, a, a I mean, obviously Shoa too, but Eyes on the Prize, masterpiece of long form documentary filmmaking. So two amazing recommendations um, to begin with. Um, before we get into the meat of uh, recorder the Marion Stokes project. I'd be really interested to hear about how you first found out. How, how did you find out about Marion Stokes in the first place? Well, when the Internet Archive acquired her collection of 70,000 tapes, um, there was some uh, an initial round of press and I read a blog post about, uh, you know, this novel collection and um, I make films that have a lot of archival footage in them. So um, the idea of working with an archive that contains virtually anything and everything really appealed to me. Um, and so I sought out Marion's son, Michael, and um, I went to Philadelphia with my producer, Kyle Martin, and we arrived at the Barclay apartment building, this incredibly Tony building in, in Rittenhouse Square, Philadelphia. And um, that was a surprise to us. And when we went upstairs, we saw um, a, a very nice apartment that had hundreds of Macintosh computers in their original boxing. And that was a big surprise too. So Kyle and I went across the street with Michael and Marion's personal secretary, Frank. And um, as we were talking, they, they started to cry. And we realized um, that this isn't just a, a story about an unprecedented archive. It's also an emotionally intense family story. And from that point on, I was determined to to really capture a portrait of this, you know, radical and, and kind of unconventional person, but also to, to really grapple with, um, you know, the gravity of the project she had pursued and all of the material that might be in it. Cool, thank you. And, and one idea that comes up in the film um, is the activist possibilities of archiving and perhaps that they are inextricably linked in some way, depending on, on what perspective you're coming from uh, archiving. Um, and that's really um, apparent in your body of work in general from the Arthur Russell film through teenage. Um, I'd love to hear you elaborate about the idea of the um, archivist as activist, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think in terms of Marion Stokes, um, her politics um, were geared around um, protecting the truth. 
Um, and obviously the truth is under attack in, in, in an extreme way um, in our media and in politics today. And Marion recognized um, the seeds of that as, as early as 1979 with the Iranian hostage crisis uh, at the birth of the 24 hour news cycle. So much of the political philosophy that um, guided her project was about seeking truth and protecting information so that people could make informed decisions. So um, that was a, a specific um, political action she was taking by archiving. But I think in more general sense, um, I'm preoccupied by the erasure of history um, it's part of why um, gentrification troubles me. Um, it, it troubles me that all sorts of historical material and cultural artifacts are destroyed and that um, if people of a certain generation um, die, that um, critical first person accounts of history are lost. Um, I got interested in archives by looking at the, the work of artists who died of AIDS and recognizing a continuity between my generation and a generation that had largely vanished. And Sarah Schulman's book, Gentrification of the Mind, helped me make this connection between gentrification and erasure of history. And there's been a lot of other artists' work who have gotten me thinking about that. And, and since then, um, I've not only taken an interest creatively in archives because I like the process and I like how making old things feel new works, but also because um, it's one way in which I can resist um, the erasure of history. And away from the Marion Stokes project for a second, I'd love to hear you speak about uh, the Bayard Rustin film that you made. Um, I was thinking so much about Bayard Rustin um, as, a, as an outsider, black queer figure, um, watching the Marion Stokes film and how in some ways, um, he's a kindred spirit to the work that you've done in general, but his spirit seems to inform the Marion Stokes film as well. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I've never made a connection between the two films, but um, for those that don't know, Bayard Rustin was um, a seminal civil rights organizer and activist. He, in a lot of ways, was the um, unsung mentor who um, worked with Martin Luther King and um, organized the March on Washington. Um, and he was a gay black man who was largely um, overlooked in the history of the civil rights movement for that reason and, and remained behind the scenes. Um, but I was interested in the phenomenon of intergenerational gay adoption, which in the 1980s, um, a number of gay couples pursued this as a means to um, get equal rights and to, to protect their relationships. And through random connection, I found out that my friend's uncle had been adopted by Bayard Rustin. And this, of course, is not a well-known aspect of his biography. So I made a film about Bayard through the lens of their kind of intimate relationship and their intergenerational gay adoption. And part of what interests me about that film and that story is this continuum of radicalism and the mainstream and how what Bayer did throughout his life, and particularly in this gesture and, and action, was incredibly radical. But it also was a form of gay marriage, which has become, um, you know, very mainstream and, and a symbol of um, kind of the assimilation of gay culture. So um, I was really interested in how a, a radical figure um, and, and can can do things that become perceived as mainstream and. In terms of a connection to Marion, I think that um, she was doing, the reason I think Marion is radical is because she pursued a project that nobody recognized or saw value in. I think she was mostly discounted as um, a pathological amateur historian, but um, she recognized that important information was being lost, that networks were not saving their material, they were discarding it and that it had historical value. And so she pursued a maddening project to save it. And um, it's only now as people see this film that indisputably they, they recognize that what she did was of incredible value and incredible significance. And some people have even kind of identified her as a visionary, but um, she did this when people didn't see that. And um, she did it by necessity, both as a black woman who was, you know, um, excluded from mainstream institutions, but also as a radical person with novel ideas 
Um, she did this privately on her own terms outside of established institutions um, that collect and preserve knowledge. So um, I think what she did now, this, this idea of having hypervigilance about protecting truth and recognizing that the media um, shapes public opinion through the predilections of its producers, these are now very mainstream liberal ideas, but um, when she was pursuing her project, um, that wasn't part of the, the political discourse or the mainstream political discourse. Thank you, that's a great answer. Um, her project is overwhelming in, in a kind of a physical sense and a conceptual sense also. So I'm wondering from a craft perspective or, or a narrative perspective for you as a nonfiction filmmaker, how did you find an entry point and how did you decide on the ways that which you would shape her narrative? I think that's the perfect word entry point is and, and that was what appealed to me about making this film is that there kind of is no entry point. It's so overwhelming. Um, so, you know, for every film with a, a significant archive, um, you have to create a unique process. And for this film, we actually had to index Marion's entire collection of 70,000 tapes. Um, and Marion, being a librarian, wrote on the spine of each tape metadata, the, the date, the time, the network, sometimes other information like Jesse Jackson or the move bombings or Oprah. And um, we created a conveyor belt system at the Internet Archive where those tapes live. And Marion stacked each tape spine up in these cardboard filing boxes and we, we pushed them down a conveyor belt and took photos from above, capturing everything that she had written on the spines of those tapes. And we put out a call for volunteers um, and some people, almost 50 people who were inspired by her story signed up around the world to log her data. And we use Dropbox and a shared Google spreadsheet. I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing that could happen right now, a very strange form of collaboration around a project and people logged. And eventually one full-time archivist named Katrina Dixon um, she came on board and finished the index, 70,000 fields of a Google spreadsheet. Um, and simultaneously, I used Wikipedia and Wikipedia has a summary of each year. And being a user generated kind of encyclopedia, it has mainstream epoch defining events, but also weird marginal things that people have chosen to add. So, um, you know, I was looking for anything from the Berlin Wall to the, um, you know, the collapse of the Berlin Wall to the collapse of the Miss America stage. And I made a wish list of these kinds of things and Katrina would go through the index finding those tapes. So, um, you know, then someone at the Internet Archive would have to get a forklift and take down the pallet and find the box and the tape. And we would take that to our preservationists, the Bay Area Video Coalition, who would digitize the tapes. And now Marion recorded an extended play so these tapes are six to eight hours long. Um, and so we only digitized 100 of 70,000 tapes, but we had 700 hours of footage. And what I would do is I would, um, you know, scrub through the footage at 10 times speed and just hit a marker anytime something looked interesting to me, whether it was a strange graphic commercial or a, a human interest story from local news or the thing I was looking for, but more often than not, the things that were most interesting were things that one could never search for. Um, for those who've seen the film, there's a, one of my favorite clips is about someone named Bruce Elliott, the anti-nostalgist um, who railed against baby boomers obsession with the past. I mean, you can't search for that, but it had such significance toward our story. But, uh, you know, once I pulled all these things, assistant editors organized them by date and subject. And um, my editor, Keiko Deguchi was able to, to really approach that material in a, in a much more uh, focused way. But we always ask ourselves the question, um, how does the archive point to Marion and how does Marion point back to the archive? Um, and we had to show some restraint. There was stuff that interests us personally that didn't have to do with Marion. We tried to look at the archive through the lens of her interests, whether it was um, politics around race, um, the representation of Cuba or communism, um, tracking the emergence of consumer technology. Um, I mean, she was interested in everything, but those were some some constants in her life, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's interesting to hear you talk about the archive in our online world as still a very physical process, you know, a, a labor intensive, totally. you mentioned the forklift. Um, 
So we have a couple of questions uh, from audience members. Um, one here, uh, there was no live footage of, of Miss Stokes. Uh, was there no live footage of Miss Stokes speaking? Um, and we didn't hear the voice uh, beyond the input show, which was absolutely incredible. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, this film is a mystery. Um, Marion, in a lot of ways, didn't want to be known. Um, she wasn't photographed for a large um, portion of her life when she was living reclusively. Um, so we used every, almost every single image that exists of Marion. Um, and the real material we could use to try to, to get closer to Marion and to understand her was this brief, this brief moment of having a public life when she was the um, host and co-producer of this public interest show in Philadelphia called Input. And um, I had every episode of it um, transcribed um, so that I could could really look in a granular way at everything that Marianne and her husband, John Stokes said um, to see um, clues about what Marianne's um, politics were, what her point of view was and her worldview, but also to, to see the burgeoning relationship between her and John who um, had not been in a relationship at that time, but fell in love. So um, that show became an important way to hear Marianne, to see and feel her because in so many ways, she's a, she's a kind of absent subject from a film about her life in the archive is, is the best proxy toward her. And something she was really, um, it's, you know, she held as an imperative from very early on was that idea of media literacy. And it kind of struck me that I was, I was really lucky when I was, I think, 16 or 17 to take a very like immersive one year class in media studies at AS level in Britain. And so much um, that I know about the media in terms of how to, to read it, in terms of theory, in terms of business, comes from that one year. And I realized how lucky I was to, to have had that. And so many people perhaps haven't had it. And uh, how do you feel about the state? It's a huge question, but the state of, of media literacy and uh, are, are people learning more just by the, the, the vast amount of uh, content that's out there now? Do, do you find that there's an acceleration of, of knowledge and learning or is there still a shortfall in understanding of media literacy? Well, I think that when I was young as well, I was involved in something called youth media that still exists, but was quite prevalent, particularly in nonprofits um, that did media arts in the early aughts and late nineties. And that were, these were programs where young people were equipped with um, technical skills and equipment to make their own media. And in that process of learning how to make documentaries or video art, um, we learned media literacy and media criticism skills. And it was from an activist point of view and created, for me, I think a lot of um, skepticism and critique of um, the bias of the person who creates media. And the best way to learn about that is to create something yourself and to see how your own point of view and flex what you're making for, for better or for worse. But um, I think that is the fundamental aspect of media literacy is recognizing the subjectivity of um, all the information that's being presented to you, whether or not it adheres to the conventions of objectivity. Um, but in terms of our media landscape, particularly for young people, it is truly democratized. This idea that you would have to train young people on how to make media is not necessary. There's millions of kids making TikToks that I, I wouldn't be creative or resourceful enough to make myself. So I think um, young people are equipped with the skills to make that. And I think just intuitively a sense that these videos come from a personal sense of creativity and um, knowledge. And I don't know if anybody young or old um, has the vigilance we need to really um, to really analyze where the information and media we share is coming from. Uh, for me personally, I see people sharing I, media that I don't think they've fully read and in which I don't think they have thoroughly vetted the source. And um, I think that's to some extent, the value of Marion's collection is that you get true context. You, you see the flow of everything that was playing on that day. It's placed in an explicit and visceral um, historical context. The Internet Archive has 
a platform, um, which you can visit at archive.org, in which you can search the news by keyword. And it will bring up lots of clips, but it shows you in context what's playing around it, what network it's on, when it aired. And that's really different than just seeing a headline or um, this, the title of a YouTube video shared on Facebook and um, presuming that the information it's conveying may be truer from a reputable source. Furthermore, the sources of information and knowledge and news in our society are now explicitly um, you know, produced through ideological um, uh, points of view, whether it's MSNBC or Fox News. So um, it's also relativized. I think it's, um, it is maddening in a sense um, what it means to be hypervigilant in terms of seeking the truth. But I think there's a lot of media that's out of context, but I think a more intuitive sense that the media that's produced is through a personal and subjective point of view. And um, speaking of media literacy, uh, re-watching the film tonight, I noticed the contribution from uh, Maurice Berger, who uh, sadly passed away very yeah. recently um, of coronavirus complications. And yeah. I, I'd love to, to hear you speak about him and, and his contribution. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. I wanted to pay tribute to Maurice. Maurice is a brilliant, he was a brilliant curator and writer. Um, he grew up in the projects on the Lower East Side and um, was obsessed with TV. And as he came of age as a kind of public intellectual, he committed his life to um, thinking about and understanding issues of race, um, particularly um, in photography. Uh, he has a beautiful blog um, on the, the Lens blog in the New York Times um, that's focused on photography and race. Um, and I, I came to him because he was curating a show about television and modernism at the Jewish Museum. Um, and he had really innovative and creative ways of thinking about television, but he also was involved in um, doing polling around elections and analyzing data um, and was a consultant to TV channels. So he was someone who, um, you know, thought about race and representation, television and its um, kind of impact and culture uh, from the point of view of the arts, as well as like a more nuts and bolts, geeky sense of, um, you know, uh, political metrics. So he was just like the perfect storm of knowledge to inform this film. And uh, although you don't see him on screen, he, he makes some amazing points that really helped me to understand the significance of the Iranian hostage crisis as it relates to the 24 hour news cycle, but also a really unique interpretation of what was so visionary and special about Marion. So um, yeah, I would like to really pay tribute to Maurice who was lost way too soon. Thank you for that, Matt. I'm, I'm gonna turn over to some audience questions now. Um, so uh, are there any specific films or works of art that were touchstones either in terms of process or form and themes? That's a good question. You know, there's this thing that when I'm in the throes of making a film, I don't really watch that many other movies, kind of on purpose. I kind of um, deprive myself of too much other cultural information when I'm really focused on making a film. Not because I don't want to be derivative, but just because my brain doesn't have the energy. Um, that's not to say there aren't films I've seen like the work of Adam Curtis that has obviously influenced me aesthetically in terms of a kaleidoscopic use of the archive through the lens of television and through the raw material of television. But um, yeah, I mean, I wanted to do things that had a video art kind of element to them, like things inspired by artists like Dara Birnbaum. Um, but uh, I also wanted to really look at the experience of television flow. Um, and um, there were interesting films like an older documentary called Feed that dealt with, with the, the liveness of television broadcasts that I watched for reference. Um, but yeah, in general, um, I think I'm also really interested in documentaries that use interviews. Something I've talked a lot about in the past year is just um, um, trying to encourage appreciation of interview-based films. I think a lot in my field, um, there's a, a certain kind of um, 
uh, I'm not going to say superstition, but a, a certain kind of reticence to embrace interviewing because it's perceived as being stodgy or conventional. But I love interview based films. Um, speaking of Shoah film, I, I recently, a nine hour film about the Holocaust that's comprised almost um, exclusively of interviews and landscape shots. But, um, you know, so I'm always watching films thinking about the interviews um, and the psychological dynamics and process in which they're conducted as well. And um, the Michael Jackson documentary, um, Leaving Never Neverland um, was a film recently that really um, inspired me in terms of its approach to interviewing and the primacy of interviews. Thank you. Um, another question here. Can you talk about the 9-11 portion of the film? Uh, it especially struck me watching it right now. Yeah, and, and you're not alone. A lot of people respond in a very visceral way to that sequence. Um, I think that, you know, I wanted, as I said, to demonstrate what television scholars call flow. Um, and that's um, the continuous broadcast across multiple networks uh, at the same time. And um, the belief that by looking at flow, one might have knowledge about the representation of, of the news or of everyday life. Um, and of course, I, I wanted to think of doing that for an, a, 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 an event of media historical significance that was universal. Um, the moon, man landing on the moon, JFK's assassination, to, to some extent, the space shuttle Challenger. But for my generation and within the scope of the taping period, 9-11 um, is that thing. I think everybody who isn't really young remembers learning of that event on television. I, I mean, I lived in the city and I was downtown, but I saw it on television before I looked and saw it outside. Um, and I think the ability to see that image and to be viscerally dropped back into a indelible moment is um, speaks to the power of television because what happened um, was only real until you saw an image on TV and the event wasn't necessarily the event. It was the event was when you saw it. So I think there's it, it's a uncanny thing. And also, I mean, my goal with the film was to make people see something that feels very familiar in an unfamiliar way or to make old things feel new. That's something I often think about. And um, yeah, I think the reason that sequence resonates with people is because it becomes very personal, um, but also it on a on a cultural level, it's uh, I know it's disarming to people that Fox is the last network to pick up on that story. I think that's just fairly random, but a lot of people look into, read into that. I think um, Ted Koppel's interstitial um, preview of a Nightline special on um, the Congo is really telling because um, the political crisis there was very significant um, at that time period and was not heavily reported in the US media. and. I think seeing that and then seeing 9-11, you realize, oh, that never would have aired and the media focus and discourse would entirely be focused on 9-11 and um, the, the, the war on terror for the next few years. So it makes you realize about things that actually got cut that were never discussed and, and the political mechanisms in which those things are excluded or overlooked. So, um, you know, it has a lot going on, even though there's no editing in the sequence at all. Thank you. And thank that, that question was from Emily. So thank you for that question. Um, you, you mentioned Michael Jackson earlier, um, and it was interesting to me that, that the time scale, the chronology of, um, of Marion is, is kind of, as she's coming to a close, we're seeing the cusp of new ways of imparting information. And I actually, to, to your last answer, rem remember, I think it was Michael Jackson was the first death that I experienced that dis dissonance between watching it unfold on the television and on the internet because it it broke yeah. on like Facebook and TMZ yeah. and on on the television he was uh, alive he was very yeah. much alive stable but on the internet he was very much dead uh -huh. um, and, and there is that sense of uncanny and and how those things develop yeah totally I mean other memories I have were like hearing on the phone that Princess Diana had died and then just immediately going to the television or 
being in junior high and the OJ Simpson verdict was coming and everyone was huddled around the TV. And when the verdict came, people just started screaming and running around. I, I just think um, there are so many, and the recent one, the Kavanaugh hearings, I was on set uh, in a film shoot and everyone on the crew was watching um, the testimony on their phones. And there are these things that connect us through television. And I think there's this perception um, both in terms of our cultural memory, but also I think in terms of our experience of life today, um, including these press briefings that I have blacked out on and don't watch anymore um, from the person I don't want to name and the governor of our state. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I think that um, there's this feeling, oh, well, social media and the internet has kind of outmoded the significance of television, but I think um, the rise of the person I don't want to name um, is really as a result of the power of Fox News and the way that an ideologically, explicitly ideologically slanted news network, um, you know, shaped public opinion was remarkable. And it, and it speaks to how television remains king in terms of impacting public opinion, um, even though the internet and misinformation online is, is a part of that. I think television was always at the center of the rise of that regime. Thanks. Uh, I have a question here from uh, Kathy C. Uh, I wonder if you could share something from Marion's extraordinary archive that didn't make it into the film uh, that perhaps you were interested in, but didn't quite fit her interests, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I mean, and like I said, I had to show some restraint and not include things that were just interesting to me. I needed to be flexible enough to be a little random sometimes to show the eccentricity of a collection of that nature, but to not start zeroing in on things that were interesting to me. I mentioned earlier, I, I have a particular interest in the history of AIDS. So anytime I saw anything related to AIDS, I, I marked it and, and pulled that. And it's fascinating stuff. It could be a whole film just of any time the word AIDS was said on television and to, to just make a chronological, um, you know, real of that unedited. Um, I think that would be fascinating, but that that wasn't really relevant to this film. There's so many films you could make out of the raw material of this. Um, and, you know, one thing that I did do is, um, I think I, I early on in the, the edit, people were like, well, you keep saying this is an important archive, but you need to demonstrate that a little bit more. And so um, that's what compelled us to, to do this cursory um, history of police brutality. It was an idea that the scholar Tom Keenan brought up. And um, it was really interesting to actually go and look for a thread in the archive, not a specific event, but a thread. And the kind of research I had to do to get a set, I mean, police brutality is, is such a um, inescapable and expansive, um, you know, um, uh, what's the word, nightmare or, uh, you know, tragedy. And so how do you track that? And it was interesting to, to try to figure out what, what stories of police brutality really sparked media attention and then to go into the archive to look for them. And it's not surprising, but it was revealing that in finding that material and then other material we weren't even looking for, there was so much um, explicit bias that was embedded in the reporting of that. So sometimes it's, you look for a specific thing, but what you find is more telling about the apparatus than the thing, the story that you're looking for, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I have another question here from a Girlfriend in a Coma UK. Uh, <laughs> Good screen it's, name. Yeah, it's, it's really serious. Um, <laughs> can you talk about your um, conceptualization of family and or motherhood uh, as political constructs uh, and how this influenced the interviews with Michael and the Stokes daughters? That's a really good question. Can you repeat it to me again? Yeah. Um, can you talk about your conceptualization of family and or motherhood as political constructs and how this influenced the interviews uh, with Michael uh, and the Stokes Daughters. It's interesting because the new film I made, Spaceship Earth, about Biosphere 2, really is about, um, 
is about um, intentional community and experiments and what a model of a family looks like, um, particularly this model of small groups. Um, and in a lot of ways, this is to some extent a more conventional family story, a story around divorce and estrangement. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think I, I, there's a conceptual and intellectual answer to that question, but I'm going to approach it more emotionally because that was how I approached the family story was through an emotional lens. Um, I think um, there was another film that I could have made that depicted Marion as the evil stepmother. Um, and that really left you feeling like she um, um, was kind of evil. And there was another film I could have made that just depicts Marion as this kind of um, political intellectual hero and dives into the archive and doesn't look at her shortcomings. And for me, it was really important to retain a certain kind of fairness in the filmmaking. And to be fair, I needed to honor the perspective of John Stokes' children who were really hurt by Marion and um, their father's relationship with her and their reclusiveness. Um, and they were alienated by her. She was um, at once insightful and also dysfunctional. And I came to realize that both things can exist simultaneously um, and that the dysfunction um, particularly, you know, played out in, in the family, but that, yeah, she, she does not subscribe to conventional models of motherhood. And that is also part of why she's radical. And it's part of what makes her interesting, but it also created pain for people. And I felt it was fair and necessary to represent that and to show the complexity of someone as a human who would pursue this kind of endeavor. Thank you. That's a great answer to a great question. Um, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. So before we wrap up, I just want to give you the opportunity to speak a little bit about your most recent film, your most recent project to tell people what it's about. Yeah, so my new film is called Spaceship Earth. It's about something called Biosphere 2. In the early 90s, this countercultural group of adventurers and ecologists and artists um, set out to build an enormous terrarium in the Arizona desert that had a miniature replica of Earth's ecosystem. And it was called Biosphere 2 because Biosphere 1 is planet Earth. Um, and this became a huge media spectacle. And when eight biospherians, as they were called, went to live inside, um, it became a kind of elaborate stage for uh, interpersonal and ecological drama. Um, and so it's a film that is about this experiment that is kind of notorious and has faded from popular memory, but it's also really a film that focuses on the, the 50 year journey of this group that conceived of the project. And as I was saying, it's, it's, it looks at this model of small groups um, as engines of change, but the film has taken on a kind of uncanny significance now because the Biospherians lived essentially quarantined for two years. But I think rather than just the novelty of isolation, um, they experienced a kind of personal transformation through that experience. And when they returned to the world, um, their sense of responsibility and duty um, as well as the fragility of the world was greatly um, enhanced. So I think there's something relevant about that that I hope can be part of the discussion of the film. Um, I can't say exactly yet when the film's coming out, but it's gonna come out sooner than later. And I hope people will check it out. It's called Spaceship Earth. Thanks, Matt. Um, I think it's a beautiful kind of on the continuum that the word continuum is used in the Marion Stokes project. I think it's a, uh, a uh, beautiful thing on the continuum of your work in general. So I urge people to check it out uh, when they are uh, able to see it. Um, but I just want to say thanks again um, for taking the time to speak to us tonight. Uh, and thanks everyone for, for watching along at home um, in, in quarantine. Uh, we really appreciate your support. So thanks very much. And uh, just keep an eye out for, for BAM.org um, and see what we're doing uh, with our programming online in this um, unusual time. Thanks so much. Good evening. Thank you, everyone.